what allowed me to get back to feeling as vibrant and active and lean as I had always been was intermittent fasting. Today's episode is a conversation I had with Cynthia Thurlow on fasting. More specifically, she gets into the nitty gritty of fasting for women. Definitely an episode that I think you're going to get a lot of insights into and how you can start sorting out your own fasting protocol. Stay tuned. Welcome to the Hard to Kill podcast, the go-to podcast for military, LEO, and EMS professionals, sharing ideas and experiences from around the world to make you hard to kill. Here's your host, Dave Morrow. Cynthia, thanks so much for hopping on the podcast. I just said on the live that you were the first expert I've ever had on the podcast that knows what they're talking about when it comes to fasting. I think I've been cobbling it together from experts like yourself, but it's going to be great to hear it straight from the horse's mouth. So welcome to the Hard to Kill podcast. And I guess we'll start with how did you end up getting 13 million views on YouTube talking about (laughs) fasting? Yeah, it's a great question. And thank you for having me, Dave. I've been looking forward to our conversation. I I think the things I didn't know now retrospectively was that in 2019, intermittent fasting was the most Googled or searched nutritional strategy or concept. Uh, And I didn't know that when I came up with the topic in 2018. And then on top of it, I, I think it really is a very clear, concise, discussion on some of the key benefits related to the strategy. And and I think when we make things really clear and concise and people can take action, then that message really resonates. And I'll give you an example. I did a talk, another Ted talk in 2018, which had a terrible title. So not only can people not find the talk, um, it was not, it was not very concise. It was an 18 minute Ted talk, still good content, But I think a lot of it has to do with the fact it was timely. I didn't realize it at the time when I selected that topic. I just selected something I knew a lot about. And there's a really cool backstory to that talk as well. Um, I tell people all the time, when you set out good intentions, sometimes magical things happen. But 27 days prior to that talk, I'd been in the hospital. And so I'd say all the time, like my pure intent when I got out of the hospital was I'm going to do this talk. So that I can show my kids I'm okay. And that was all that I put out into the universe. And a lot of magic came out of that. I had no idea what was going to was going to precipitate from just Yeah, it's talk. wild. So what's the name of the the talk that got twelve million views? And then I'll ask you, what was the name of the talk that got probably not twelve million views? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So the 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 second TEDx talk I did is the intermittent fasting transformation. So a, easy to find, right? Um and then my talk on perimenopause, which should have been a talk st- uh, titled perimenopause, was surviving to thriving. And so as you can imagine, it's hard to find that talk um, if you're looking for good information on how women navigate reverse mm. puberty. And so it, I, I learned a very valuable lesson very early right. on. Uh, a very valuable lesson in uh, search engine optimization, which when you get into this space, right, it comes in, it comes yeah. into play, right? Like you have excellent content, but if nobody finds it, there's, yeah. there's, it's moot almost at that, at that point. Um, I've, I've watched the video. It's, it's amazing. I actually, I, I watched exactly. it before I was even, uh, tracking because it was, uh, Dr. Avedia who I've had on the podcast who said, Oh, you might, uh, you might want to get Cynthia on your podcast. And I was like, Oh yeah. I listened to her Ted talk, which, Interesting enough, because I was I was getting involved in intermittent fasting. So as soon as you put it on inter- intermittent fasting in Google, you're one of the you're you're the front page. So that was a, just a natural uh, natural thing for me to watch, and it, it's a great talk and uh, very well delivered. So you you gave that talk, you blew up the internet. <laughs> how how did you get how did you get to that point? You said you were in the hospital. Like what led you to doing a TED talk that ended up blowing up the topic of intermittent fasting? Well, in 2016, I had gotten pretty fed up. I am an allopathic trained nurse practitioner. I worked for 16 years in cardiology and I love being an NP, but the traditional allopathic model of waiting for patients to get a disease process 
and then writing prescriptions or doing interventions was really wearing heavily on me. And I, I felt like I could make a much larger impact. So in 2016, without a business plan, which I don't recommend, I left clinical medicine and took a leap of faith. And I told my engineer husband, who was freaking out, I said, I'm going to be successful. I, I have no doubt. And he, of course, gave me, kindly gave me a year or two to kind of figure out what, what direction my business was going. And so by the time I got to 2018, I decided as an introvert, I wanted to do uh, what I consider to be a, a fairly safe challenge, you know, getting up in front of a room full of people, delivering a talk and and doing it in a way that is both persuasive and helpful. And so that was the intention. I didn't do a TED talk for any other thing other than challenging myself as an introvert. And we sent out a lot of applications. I got three offers to talk. So I accepted the first, which was in Toronto of December of 2018. And around that time I was offered my second. Yeah, I was offered my second TEDx talk and you can't do the same topic for two talks. So you have to come up with an original idea. And so I looked at my husband and said, what do I know a lot about? He said, intermittent fasting. I said, fine, I'll do it about intermittent fasting. We pitched the idea. I went through multiple interviews for this, um, this talk in South Carolina. And when I was offered the opportunity to speak, I was like, absolutely not realizing that I would be hospitalized right before I was giving this talk. And so you know, from my perspective, um, I, I feel like through adversity comes opportunity. And so on a lot of levels, despite being in the hospital for 13 days, um, I was really committed, get committed to coming home to my family and then secondarily committed to the message that I felt like it was so invaluable and so important. And so 27 days after I left the hospital, I delivered a talk that changed my life and the life of my family profoundly. And so I really, really fervently believe, and I know this is a message that would resonate with your your community, is that sometimes when we get get struck down the hardest, we get back up and we are we persevere and we work through you know the traumas of what we've experienced. We can create some pretty incredible things. So I remind people all the time that mindset is the most important thing we possess, without question. And so, you know, from, from my perspective, when I look back, you know, from three and a half years ago, I'm in awe of what's changed, but I'm grateful to know that I now can impact more people than I ever could have seeing patients in the hospital or in clinic. And I get to do it on my terms. I don't know how familiar you are with the laws that govern advanced practice nurses, but at the time that I was practicing in my state, I wasn't fully autonomous, which meant I had a physician that had to come behind me and say yay or nay to all the plans I created, which retrospectively, it was a good learning opportunity, right? But I look at it now and I'm like, I am such a badass businesswoman that I don't want anyone telling me what I can or cannot do. So I I look at it as that leap of faith in 2016 has led to so many incredible opportunities that I'm so grateful that I didn't live in a mindset of scarcity and that I really genuinely took a loop, a leap of faith. Again, I don't recommend any entrepreneurs do that without creating a solid business plan, but it ended up working out, you know, really to my benefit. And now I can't imagine doing what I was doing before, although I'm very grateful for the opportunities mm-hmm. that I've had. Hey, handsome. Did you know I'm going to be the number one alternative health podcast in Canada, not just for veterans. That's already a given. I'm so close to cracking that top 100 spot, but I need your help. I need you to go rate, review, share this podcast and make sure that this cracks the top 100, top 50, top 10. And let's get more veterans moving and grooving and feeling good because they get to hear all the awesome content with the incredible guests that come on this show. All right, that's it for me. Go do what you got to do. Love you. There's a lot of similarities between the way you started business and the way I started business. I got fired and decided I'm going to start a business, but I had no money coming in. I was like, what better time than do it right now, right? I'm not making any money. I might not make more money for three more years. Let's let's start a business. Um, so uh, I feel you on that. Um, now, I guess my question is, uh, like you're a nurse practitioner. I'm not quite sure exactly what 
I'm sure we have them here in Canada, but I'm just not tracking. It sounds like you're a doctor, but there's there's some mm-hmm. nuances there. So what, what what is this the nuance there between nurse practitioner and a doctor, and like why would somebody choose a nurse practitioner over being a medical doctor? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think that the easy answer for me was I wanted a different quality of life. I had uh, parents that were very successful and weren't really home, weren't able to go to meet, weren't able to see us play sports, weren't really involved in our day to day. And I have plenty of physicians in my family and I know what the cost of being a female physician is uh, from a lifestyle perspective And so uh, in in conjunction with talking to female family members that are in medicine, I felt like being a nurse practitioner was a good go-between. So I still have the ability to write prescriptions. I could admit patients to the hospital. I can manage very sick people in the ICU, the ER, send them to surgery, fly in a chopper. But, um, you know, ultimately there is, there, there is a, you, you get most of your training as an NP on the job, uh, as opposed to having a long residency. So I can tell you when I finished at Johns Hopkins in the early 2000s, uh, we were all begging for residencies because we felt like we weren't ready to be to have this much responsibility because you really do have a tremendous amount of responsibility. But one of the differentiators that I saw is I had no interest in doing surgery. I had no interest in doing procedures. Um, I... I think one of the real benefits and um, distinctions between physicians and nurse practitioners is that we are trained differently. We are trained technically off of a nursing model, not a medical model. Um, The relationships that we form with our patients are are quite significant. And we really take into account the entire person, not just a Mm -hmm. body system, not just a symptom. And that's not to suggest there aren't dynamic physicians that can do that, but we're trained differently. We have differing relationships. And so I took the path where it was not ego dominated. I took the path that would still be intellectually challenging, but would allow me to have a quality of life because unlike the way I grew up, I wanted my children to have me be very hands-on and I have been. And so I'm really grateful that that was an easy decision for me to make. It's not one that I regret, but I can tell you now I'm appreciative that my kids are the age they are now, as opposed to if I'd been doing this 15 years ago, it would have been impossible. So they're teenagers and a little bit more independent, you know, day to day. So it allows me the flexibility to be able to step into a different role. But NPs in the United States and other advanced practice nurses, nurse anesthetists, uh, midwives, et cetera, play a huge role in the structure of healthcare organizations and I would argue that we are critically important because we fill a void that the average physician doesn't want to. They don't want to necessarily spend a lot of time with their patients. And the way that our schedules were created was that we had the opportunity to spend more time with the patients, get to know them, maybe get a more detailed history, um, and really act as a as a really integral part in that hmm. that healthcare team. That's really interesting. I mean, I don't obviously know much about the medical field or the nurse practitioner field. But from what I, what I'm hearing is that you get a much better relationship with the patient. And uh, the only other comparable I would have is osteopathic medicine, where you look at the system rather than just the symptom. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the unfortunate, I guess, interaction I'm having with my medical team, right? Like, when I go see my doctor, it's like, he looked at my blood work, he's like, Oh, this one marker is high, maybe we should put you on statins. I'm like, but I just did the iron man. I'm, I'm, I think I'm pretty good. Like I, I'm, I'm healthy. I'm lean. Like, do I really want to go on statins? It, there was no conversation. It was t- two minutes. Just didn't ask me like, Hey, how's your life? How are you sleeping? It was just take statins. I was like, well, I don't know about that. So it seems like you give them a much better holistic approach to uh, patient care and it's more healthcare than sick care. Um, so, and it sounds like you have yes. like, just as much training, which is really interesting. And that would be something that if I were to do it all over again, would probably be <laughs> my line of, uh, my line of education, but uh, alas, I'm 41 and I'm loving what I'm doing, uh, being able to talk to people like you that have the expertise. And you mentioned earlier, you just being able to like reach more people, right. And use what you have mm-hmm. on your training side with the entrepreneur side and essentially bring it to scale, uh, and be on podcasts and talking to Canadian veterans and, and, uh, making sure that your message gets disseminated widely, which I think is great. Um, and, uh, so that, therefore I want to talk a bit, uh, about fasting, obviously what made you quote unquote, like comfortable or the expert 
so to speak, when it came to doing a TED Talk? Because obviously you must have had a large body of knowledge to have the courage to go up and talk to an audience at a TED conference. So what is it and, and what brought you to that, to that talk, essentially? Yeah, I, I would say the first answer is I'm like most women out there that, you know, everything I had been taught about nutrition and weight maintenance, I mean, I'd never struggled with my weight and seemingly overnight in my early 40s, I was weight loss resistant. I couldn't sleep. Um, I was exhausted all the time. And, and, you know, I was like, you know, racking my brain thinking what could be going on. And I'm grateful that I had a really talented friend who was also a functional medicine provider. And so we kind of got together and got a lot of answers, but part of what allowed me to get back to feeling as vibrant and active and lean as I had always been was intermittent fasting. And I started weaving the work into all of the work I was doing with my one-on-one clients and in group programs. And that really started the ball rolling with me talking more and more about it. Um, and then I started a podcast and we were talking about it in the podcast. And so it really started out very innocently, not realizing that that would ultimately be something that I would be known for. And in fact, I tell people intermittent fasting picked me, cool. you know, I, I talk about the fact that I, I think it's such an important strategy, but I was meant to be that person at that time talking about exactly a strategy that so many people were desperate for information on. I, I think that um, if you look at the weight loss industry, it's a, you know, I forget how many billions of dollars per year they bring in in revenue and, and, and profit and it's designed to set you up to fail. You know, you're going to get a potion or a pill or a powder, and it's going to give you the results you want for a week, two weeks, a month. And then all of a sudden you're going to be yo-yo dieting. And I feel like as a clinician that we really owe it to our patients to offer up strategies that are sustainable and stop telling our patients as an example that you need to exercise more and eat less. Well, that's BS. And so, uh, you know, for a lot of us, it's really the, the interrelationship and interplay between hormones that can make us weight loss resistance and re weight loss resistant. And that's where fasting on many levels can be very helpful for not just men, but also women and really leaning into our physiology. I always say that uh, what makes us both unique and different is things that we should embrace. We shouldn't apologize for it. And so I really encourage uh, men and women to like lean into what makes us unique, not apologize for it and embrace mm. what works. What you're saying here is subversive, Cynthia. You're saying that the weight loss industry is doing it wrong, that uh, we can do something that costs zero dollars and and, uh, and sort out our obesity epidemic. I don't know. I don't know if this is going to go over well on Facebook. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I love it. This is the fact that Jason Fung was your inspiration. Same, same here. I remember, I don't, I have no idea why I came across his book. It's probably the internet. The internet drops hints, right? And like you said, the universe sends you the answers. You just need to listen. So I got dialed into his book, you know, fellow Canadian. I was like, okay, cool. Um, it's the obesity code, right? That's his first book. So that was, yeah, ground. The complete yeah, there you fasting. go. There you go. So that was just earth shattering to me because it broke my belief that, like you said, uh, eat less, do more is the only way to lose weight. And as soon as I started applying his methodology and just, you know, long story short, it's essentially you're looking at it from a hormonal perspective rather than a caloric perspective, mm -hmm. which is kind of scientific and engineering, like thermodynamic based. It just all clicked. I was like, Oh, oh. <laughs> and so from there, it was it was off to the races. So let's get into it. What is intermittent fasting or or fasting in general? What 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 does it mean? And and we can get a little bit into the science as well. Yeah. So intermittent fasting is as easy as eating less often. And that can look very different for each one of us, depending on what life stage we're in, what gender we are. And when I think about some of the key benefits of intermittent fasting, I think people focus on the body composition, the weight loss. But what I like to really talk about is the changes in brain cognition and brain health, more energy as your body is able to adapt and utilize both carbohydrates and fatty acids as a fuel substrate. We know there's a particular type of ketone. It's called beta-hydroxybutyrate. When that diffuses across the blood-brain barrier, it's one of the 
reasons why we have tremendous mental clarity when we are in a fasted state and insulin levels are lower. I think about improvement in inflammation, gut health. I think a lot about a reduction in risk of neurocognitive disorders like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, a reduction in specific cancers, including breast and colorectal cancer. And I think about this principle that some of your listeners may or may not be familiarized with, but autophagy, which is this waste and recycling process that goes on in the body and gets upregulated in an unfed state. And it works in conjunction with another um, process called mTOR. And so when we're eating, mTOR is upregulated. When we're not eating, autophagy is upregulated. But autophagy is particularly important because it gets rid of cells that could be dysfunctional or could go on to actually create or make us more susceptible to precancerous or cancerous cells. And so I, I think in our modern day lifestyles, when we're conditioned to believe that snacks and mini meals are the way to maintain our health, I'll be the first person to say that that couldn't be farther from the truth. And actually going through periods of food scarcity, or what I like to refer to is, you know, periods of feasting and periods of fasting is very aligned with an ancestral health perspective. And I think we forget this. I think that the, the media really likes to portray um, likes to portray fasting as new and novel. And I'll be the first person to say it dates back to biblical times. It is not new or novel. It is incorporated into all the major religions that I'm aware of. And it really is aligned with the way our bodies are designed to thrive. We're not designed to be garbage cans. We're not designed to eat hyper palatable, highly processed foods, eat all day long, sit on our butts, not move, not sleep well, be dopamine addicts because we're constantly on our phones or we're checking notifications or we're not connecting with nature. I mean, all the things that make us human beings get negated upon in our modern day lifestyles. And so I think fasting is one way to really honor the way that our bodies are designed to thrive as opposed to, you know, having those limiting beliefs that I referred to earlier where I say, oh, it's just the way things are because I'm X age, you know, I'm 41, I'm supposed to be on five medicines and have lots of aches and pains and I can't sleep and I've got a big belly. That's not the way our bodies are designed to thrive. It's exactly the antithesis mm -hmm. of that. Yeah. I mean, I love that you mentioned uh, we're not garbage cans. That's, that's so true. It's, a constant mm -hmm. feeding ha was a paradigm that I thought was 100% true because I read it in men's health when I was like 18. It's like the only way you're going to keep muscle mass and get bigger and stronger is if you constantly eat. Now, in a bodybuilding context, that's not entirely mm -hmm. wrong. But in a general population context, there's nothing that could be further from the truth. I've done that and I swell up. And the unfortunate reality is that we train our kids early as well, right? To have snack time. Like my kids always have snack time. I'm like, they'll be fine. <laughs> like they can go from breakfast to lunch without a snack. They'll be okay. Um, so what is it then? I mean, you mentioned um, autophagy and mental clarity, which I'm on a fast right now. So I did that post on Sunday. As my, I'm at 48 hours now. I always do it before a podcast. I always do it before a podcast because, you know, it's been about two years, three years that I've been fasting relatively regularly. I use it as like a, like a hidden weapon, I guess, when I need to do something that's really cerebral or very, I have to be very dialed in. I know that I'm going to be dialed in. I'm, I'm going to find my words. It's just something that I do and I love it. So water, coffee, that's it. So for you, um, for somebody to get started with fasting, it could be really daunting. I know for me, it was kind of daunting because I thought I was going to lose all my muscle mass. That was my concern. I'm like, I'm going to lose my gains. <laughs> and for me, that was like, that was, that, that was, that was a non-starter. But until I read Jason Fung's book, it's like, no, no, no. Like you're, it's like building a log cabin and then taking all the furniture and throwing it on the fire. Your, your metabolism doesn't work that way. And I had cognitive dissonance there because I knew that I, I, I did my biochemical degree. I, I understood at a fundamental level how cells work and how metabolism worked. But for whatever reason, I couldn't wrap my head around the fact that if you don't eat, you're going to lose your gains. So once I started doing it, I realized that wasn't the case. I'm fine. I get a little panicky around breakfast time if I don't eat. But for the person that's starting out, like what is, what is the biggest hurdle that you've seen? And, and how does somebody just get started with fasting so that they can improve their health? Yeah, I think for many, many people, it's just the getting over the mindset, the fear that they're going to starve, which is not going to happen because even thin people like you and I have plenty of stored fat to be able to fuel our bodies. It's just 
we've gotten so conditioned to utilizing glucose as the only fuel substrate that our bodies are inefficient. It's almost like we're not giving ourselves the right type of fuel if we want to make the car analogy. And so I I think the starting point for most people is to stop snacking. And that blows people's minds because they've been conditioned to believe that it's okay to snack in between meals and snack while you're making dinner and, you know, snack after dinner. So rip off the Band-Aid and stop snacking is the first important step because it will force you to restructure your macros and your macros are protein, fat, and carbs. And I think for a lot of people, they are under eating protein, they're overeating processed carbs, they're eating the wrong types of fats like seed oils. And so when I tell people to stop snacking, they're going to be putting bigger portions of protein because that's the most satiating macronutrient we have. It's also really important for muscle protein synthesis and so when I, when I reflect on that transitional period, stop snacking, restructure your macros, you're like really lean into 30 to 50 grams of protein with each meal. And then, you know, adding in non-starchy carbohydrates and the healthy fats. But here's another way where people get tripped up is they think they can eat all the butter and all the avocados and five pounds of nuts. And I just remind them, if you have a ribeye or a piece of salmon, you've got plenty of fats in that meal. You don't need to be adding copious amounts of fats versus if you sit down and have a sta- a filet or you have a piece of cod that tend to be leaner meats, yes, you can add in some healthy fats, but understanding that fats are more nutrient dense. They're almost double the amount of calories per gram as a carbohydrate or protein. And so really making sure people understand the way that when we're looking at the, the, horm- the, the hierarchy of macronutrients, it's protein, 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 non-starchy carbs, healthy fats if they're needed. And really, if you start restructuring your meals, the goal is to not be hungry in between meals. So that's like the number, that's like the second thing. You're not hungry in between meals. That's how you know that you have your macros dialed in. And then the next thing is understanding that you go from eating your dinner and finishing to not eating again until breakfast the following day. What people don't understand is most people are fasting nine, 10 hours, maybe longer, um, effortlessly. They just get caught up in their heads. Oh my gosh, I hear 16 hours of not eating. I'm going to die. No, you're not you're actually going to optimize so many you know, biochemical markers as well as biophysical markers, keep your blood sugar stable, lower your insulin, and allow your body to do exactly what it's supposed to be doing as opposed to this constant grazing or the under eating of protein, eating too many carbs. And I'm not anti-carb. I just like people to be aware of you know, the hierarchy of carbohydrates, like real types of carbohydrates, like root vegetables and non-starchy vegetables and low glycemic berries are going to be higher on the hierarchy than processed crap, which unfortunately, I think the last statistic I read was most Americans, Mm -hmm. and I can only speak for Americans because I don't have any Canadian statistics, but most Americans are eating 60 to 70% of their diet is processed. And I'm not just talking about like, yes, even if you have raw cacao, that is technically processed, but I'm talking about hyper palatable, highly processed foods. And we have food like substances. Most of us aren't even eating real food. And so that's kind of the methodology I use. No snacking, restructure your macros, go from dinner to breakfast, and then slowly start opening up that feeding window. The more carbohydrate dependent someone is, the more obese and insulin resistant they are. It may take them weeks, four to six weeks, maybe longer to become more metabolically flexible But I have patients that have gotten off of diabetes medications, high blood pressure medications fairly easily just by changing when they eat, not even restructuring everything else, but just by changing when they eat and when they do not eat. And I remind everyone that with very few exceptions, every person listening to this podcast can benefit from at least a 12 hour window of time every day where you do not eat at a bare minimum. Even women that are right before they get their menstrual cycles, even, you know, my teenagers are growing, they go at least 12 hours a day without eating and they're, you know, they're both ridiculously Mm. lean and muscled and, you know, all of those things. But, but I think we've gotten away from being attuned to what is the best way to honor our bodies and that's eating less frequently. So ideally, well, I guess ultimately everybody does an intermittent fast at some point during our 24 hour cycle, because we have to sleep at some point and there's a gap there, right? 
or well, I, I think of it as okay. digestive rest because I don't think of twelve hours as really fasting. That's digestive rest, and I, I think when we start getting towards fifteen, sixteen hours, that's where I would to say that is a choice to eat less often. But twelve hours is still beneficial, but that's that's a starting point. That should not be the gold standard for everyone. Meaning most people would benefit from going through periods of time where they're not mm, eating as frequently. Okay. Gotcha. So then. For somebody that's getting started and fasting, like, okay, cool. But what benefit is it to me? You you touched on, you know, the, the reduction in disease. But for somebody that's looking at it from, a, I guess, more refined perspective, what's going to happen inside, like cellularly, metabolically to somebody that just decides, hey, I'm going to start fasting and I'm going to give it a go for, let's say, 45 days. <laughs> Random number. <laughs> um, so I, I think that you know, from a cellular level, you're going to help with insulin sensitivity. You're going to help with um, glucose transference into the cell. You're going to improve mitochondrial efficiency. And and for a lot of people, people hear this buzzword mitochondria, but by the age of 40, most of us have some degree of mitochondrial dysfunction. It's, it's like, just like aging <laughs> in many other ways, things don't work as efficiently, but for people that have chronic diseases like fibromyalgia, diabetes, et cetera, you've got mitochondrial dysfunction even if prior to the age of 40. But when I, I think about the, the most important thing from my perspective is understanding that, you know, sometimes even with a 16, 18, 20 hour fast, you get upregulation in autophagy, which is when your body goes in and gets rid of the trash, gets rid of things that don't belong. You've also got the process of the glymphatic system in the brain. That's another trash taking out uh, purpose that goes on in the brain where only at night, because it takes up 25% of your brain's um, energy, your body goes in and cleans out plaques and debris and things that would otherwise go on to potentially create disease. So when I think about things on a cellular level, it's really that simple that it's optimization. It is mitochondrial efficiency. Obviously there are, um, you know, more scientific type things that go on with, with NAD and sirtuins and, um, other things, you know, those are proteins and energy sources uh, within the cells that can be very helpful. But from a high level perspective for the average person to understand, it's like your body goes in and takes mm. out the trash. It's, it's like, you know, we put our trash at the end of our driveway and the garbage truck comes through. Um, that's exactly what's going on when we're, we're eating less frequently and really understanding that, you know, even if you look at research on, for example, breast cancer remission, um, as one example, because this is certainly relevant to my patient population, uh, women that, that have breast cancer and are remission are going to do better with having longer periods of time of autophagy and not eating so that their body can get rid of things that don't belong because they already, you know, there's this whole Warbar Warbarg hypothesis. There was a great guest I had on Sam Apple, and he was talking about Otto Warburg, who, uh, you know, was this Nobel laureate, Nobel prize winner, that a lot of his research was minimized because of the onset of uh, DNA discovery. And so his work, which now has kind of reemerged is cancer hypothesis of how cancer cells use a different type of fuel than other types of cells. And so really important to understand that, you know, when, when our cells aren't working efficiently, it puts us at risk for going on to develop precancers and cancer cells. And so understanding that on a cellular level that the types of fuel substrate that our fuel that our cells are using is of particular interest to me and also of, of particular importance as it should be to everyone especially as we're continuing to see that you know people who aren't smokers are developing lung cancer and we're seeing younger people with no family history of breast cancer developing breast cancer and so you know from my perspective as a clinician it's like what are the things we can all do that are fairly easy i say fairly because it's relative to each person that are going to improve the quality of your life, that are going to lessen your likelihood of developing chronic diseases, that are going to improve met metabolic health. That's a huge focus mm -hmm. of the work that I do is just helping people understand what is metabolic health? Why do we care about it? Why is it important? Okay. Um, so if let's say somebody is taking this on, they're going to start <laughs> fasting. What would compel them to do this as opposed to what traditionally we would do, which is caloric restriction, which is basically like drop your calories by like 200 every week until you're like miserable and still losing weight. What's, what's the difference? Like is, is essentially fasting just caloric restriction that's causing the weight loss or is there something else going on there? 
It's a good question. And it's one that I get asked often. And so I always say like, our bodies, it's not just the law of thermodynamics because the seco people, calories in, calories out, they always squawk. It's just thermodynamics, calories in, calories out. And I remind them, and I've had conversations with Dr. Jason Fung about exactly this. Sorry, groaning <laughs> dog on my floor. Um, about exactly this, that our bodies are so much more sophisticated than that. It is not just a calories in, calories out model. There are certain processes in the body that get upregulated in an unfed state you know, you are eating less food, but you're also benefiting from these periods of time of not eating when your body optimizes, whether you fast long enough stem cells, telomere length, um, you know, upregulation and growth hormone, autophagy, et cetera. And so our bodies are far more sophisticated than it's just an input and an output. And I interviewed Dr. Robert Lustig and, and the SECO model drives him crazy too. And he said, you know, you need a bomb calorimeter. He said, we are not science experiments. Um, it is certainly far more sophisticated than that. And we're, we're minimizing. And in many ways, I think it's, it's transferring a focus on what the bigger issue is, you know, weight loss resistance, um, is really a byproduct of a carbohydrate insulin model. And considering that the average, again, statistics here in the United States, average American consumes 200 to 300 grams of carbs a day, and that's average. So there are people consuming way more than that. And understanding what carbohydrates do to provoke an insulin response, that is very different than saying, oh, it's just all about calories. That's all that it is. You're overeating calories. You're not burning them off enough. Um, I, I think that's overly simplistic. And I think it really misses the role of hormonal regulation in the body, the hormone hierarchy. A lot of the things that impact metabolic health involve hormones and hormones are chemical messengers. If you're Listeners are not familiar with that. It's important to understand that there is not a there is not a hormone in the body that doesn't directly impact other hormones, other body systems, other organs. And so when when men or women tell me they're weight loss resistant, I almost always say we need to not only look at what you're eating, when you're eating, but also are you hormonally optimized? And here in the United States, the number one reason men are testosterone deficient is related to um, insulin resistance, as well as exposure to endocrine mimicking chemicals in our personal care products, environment, and food. And so before someone wants to shake a finger at, you know, these are lifestyle choices that are impacting our hormones in negative ways. They want to just have this very reductionistic perspective that, oh, it's just about calories. That's all it is. If you live in a calorie deficit enough, then you're going to be able to lose weight. It doesn't work that easily if you are hormonally um, not optimized. And I'm not talking about hormone replacement therapy. I'm just saying if your hormones are not properly attuned and balanced, you will struggle with weight loss. Period. So that's what you were discussing earlier. And you just mentioned it, that weight loss resistance is essentially the individual that has quote unquote tried everything. And you typically, I guess, are older, I guess, older than 30, maybe in your forties, men and women. I know you're, 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 you're talking a lot about uh, women cause that's your, your specialty, but I've, I've experienced it. I've worked with clients. I've experienced it. Um, so what you're saying is that if that's the case, you need to ensure that your hormones are dialed in for men, testosterone, but in general, what are the, the, the main hormones that somebody should be looking at? Because I'm, I assume you can go get them tested at your, you know, your doctor to see like, are you optimal? What would be for somebody that's curious, where, where, where would they go and, and what hormone test would they do? Yeah, I mean, I look at the hormone I hierarchy as things like oxytocin, which really isn't tested, um, cortisol and insulin, which can be tested. Um, and it's really understanding that these three hormones govern our sex hormones, our thyroid hormones, our, our appetite hormones, our appetite suppressant hormones. And understanding that as an example, you know, the past two and a half years, we've had unprecedented stress, right? There's no one out there that would say from, the last two and a half years have been what? easy, I, right? We've been separated from our loved ones, from family, wearing masks and travel restrictions and all sorts of nonsense. Um, with that being said, I think that when we're under chronic stress, we know that cortisol initially goes up. And when cortisol goes up, guess what goes up? Insulin goes up, um, which has a direct impact on our blood sugar, which has a direct impact on appetite. And so before we can 
you know, shake a stick and say, oh, we need to look at worry about testosterone. No, way before you worry about testosterone, this is where we're dialing in on sleep quality, stress management. What types of foods are you eating? Are you eating an anti-inflammatory diet or do you eat a highly processed hyperpalatable diet? Do you exercise? You know, you mentioned that you and your wife are very physically active. And I would say understanding the role of muscle as uh, an insulin sensitizing hormone that uh, think of it as a glucose reservoir mm -hmm. Um, is really important, you know, managing exposure to toxins, gut health. I mean, there's so many issues. Oxytocin is important just to mention because oxytocin hits. It's like when you, when a woman is breastfeeding a child, their body releases oxytocin and it allows this bonding between mother and baby. We can get oxytocin hits from hugging a loved one, from hugging our dog, from doing something that brings us joy, having an orgasm, reading a book that you're excited about, um, just doing something that brings you joy. It could be for every person, it could be very different and unique, but oxytocin lowers cortisol, not forever, but it lowers cortisol two to three minutes at a time, but you need oxytocin hits throughout the day. So when we're really talking about the hormone hierarchy and talking about these key hormones, it's really understanding that there is no hormone that is not impacted by others. And so when we're looking at cortisol, it's understanding like what drives cortisol up, chronic stress, food choices, stress, et cetera. And that has a downward effect on insulin. And insulin, unfortunately, gets a really bad rap. I like to check fasting insulins on all my patients. This is oftentimes the very first biomarker that will dysregulate way before fasting glucose, way before an A1C, which is a 90-day snapshot of blood sugar control, way before a lot of these other inflammatory uh, markers like high sensitivity CRP, et cetera. And so those can be drawn, you know, you can do cortisol um, with both saliva as well as blood. Um, that can be beneficial to look if you're dealing with chronic stress, like their cortisol levels are really low, which has a direct impact on DHEA, which impacts testosterone. I mean, there, there is no hormone hierarchy that doesn't impact other hormones. But I think from a very basic level, understanding that irrespective of gender, these things are very, very important. And also understand that for women in particular, women under the age of 35, understanding that you know our bodies are designed at that time to procreate. Even if you are choosing not to become a parent at that time or ever, your body is exquisitely sensitive to cues from the environment. And if you're not eating enough food, it can shut down communication between your brain and your ovaries saying there's no way that we can sustain a pregnancy. There's not enough food coming in or there's not enough nutrients or we sense there's a lot of stress, external stress for perimenopausal women. So women that are 10 to 15 years prior to menopause, average age in the United States is 51 that applies to most westernized countries as well. That's a time when women uh, are having reverse puberty is the easiest way to over to under explain it. And for people to really understand that at each life stage and men go through mm -hmm. andropause, that's something people don't really realize. Understanding that at, least at, at each life stage, we have the ability to become less stress resilient. And this is why um, hormesis or hermetic stressors I think are very important in the right amount, at the right time, at the right life stage, meaning if you're still a menstruating woman and you're still in peak fertile years, you're not adding in fast in the week before your cycle. If you're a menopausal woman and you can't sleep and your stress is out of control, you don't add in hormesis. If you are a guy and you're middle-aged and your wife just left you and you, you know, you're bankrupt and you have all these stressors, do not add in more stress. Like your body is like time out. I've had enough. And I think it's that important understanding that each one of us are bioindividuals. Each one of us do beneficial, do benefit from hormesis or hermetic stress, but it has to be in the right amount at mm, the right time. Yeah. I love that concept of hermetic stress. That's kind of like the, just adding in a little bit of uncomfort, discomfort, sorry, during your day. Um, and it's something that I do regularly, mm -hmm. a little bit of cold shower here and there, some sauna work, even just physical activity, go mm -hmm. lifting weights, it burns, you know, like it, it, it's, it's hormetic stress. It gets you stronger. Uh, but in this case, fasting, right. Is it's hard. It's difficult. You're not eating. You might be hungry, but the benefits you get are, are very good. But like you're saying, and that, I think that's the, the biggest point and I'm guilty of this as well. I want to optimize everything all at once, even if I'm sh very stressed. I've got deadlines, kids are stressing me out, you know, life is just getting, I'm like, no, I fast on Mondays, so I'm going to fast on Monday. 
but then I, I guess I don't get the benefit of that fast because I'm already stressed out. And I guess wisdom is going to have to set in at some point. And if I can summarize your, your hormonal, um, I guess, axis or hormonal priority, however you want to say it, um, since it's oxytocin, cortisol, and insulin, so therefore hugs, chilling out, and fasting would be like the main objective for any individual to kind of get their hormones sorted right yeah and i think you know for each one of us it's some of us are more stress resilient i know that a lot of your listeners are former military um, vets and so for me i i'm a total adrenaline junkie i was an er nurse in inner city baltimore i worked in cardiology which is one of the most high acuity stressful specialties to be in and i realized over time that i needed to stop proving myself that you know, I think I picked those really kind of volatile environments to kind of prove how tough I was, how smart I was. And I look back now and I'm like, that was great in my 20s and 30s, but it did not serve me in my 40s. And I'm so grateful that I now get my kicks from standing on stage or doing great podcasts or connecting with people. I don't feel like I have to prove myself. And so I recognize that stress, it's the right amount at the right time. And for me, it's way more stress than I need. And I don't want to ever say it was too much responsibility because I thrived on like being calm and in an, uh, like a chaotic environment, but it's the realization that for many of us, like what we do in our teens, twenties and thirties may not serve us in middle age and beyond. And that's totally okay. You know, the, the, the resilience of an organism is directly proportional to um, the amount of stress that is going on externally to them. And um, you know, plenty of us, if you've got young kids and you're, not able to sleep in on the weekends and you're up late at night catching up. I mean, there's so many stressors that are on us, especially given the fact that we're now a society that's connected 24 seven. So people feel like they feel guilty if they're not working Mm -hmm. every day. And that shouldn't be the case. We really have to put boundaries in place to um, allow ourselves to Mm -hmm. really thrive. That makes a lot of sense. Um, So Cynthia, if you don't mind me asking, what's your protocol look like? What is your fasting protocol daily, weekly? What does that look like? Yeah, I mean, I fast most days. My fast could be 13 hours one day, could be 18 the next. I'm an intuitive eater and I'm an intuitive faster. And if I'm lifting a lot or more often, I will be much more hungry. Um, I'm also very cognizant. How is my sleep? What's my stress like? Um, today's a good example. I have a very heavy day. Um, and so, and I'm also solo parenting. So, you know, I'm not going to stress, I'm not going to fast for 20 plus hours. I actually broke my fast around 18 hours, um, in between all my appointments I have today so that I could make sure I got a good bolus of food. And then I'll have another bolus of food after my next appointment. But I, I think that I encourage people when they are metabolically flexible to lean into intuitive eating, if you're, if you're weight loss resistant, you're insulin resistant, you're leptin resistant, you are not able to intuitively eat. You're still, there's still this communication mismatch with your hormones. And so it takes a bit of time for some people to get to that point. And it's also trusting intrinsically, like I don't count my macros anymore. I know where my protein threshold needs to be. If I, if I'm craving more carbohydrate, if I need more sweet potato, I'll eat it, but it's taken years to be able to get to that point. And I don't expect people to go from being a couch potato, eating a standard American diet to leaping forward four days later, and they've suddenly, you know, conquered intermittent fasting and they can intuitively fast. I think for a lot of people, it can take weeks, if not months to get to a point where they can really lean into what their body is intrinsically telling them to do. And unfortunately, that's the antithesis of what we teach our patients. So there's a lot of, um, there's, there's a lot of retraining that goes on, not just with clinicians, but also with patients and clients mm. as well. Yeah, that point of relearning how your body feels is mm-hmm. probably the single best skill, if you want to call it, that you can relearn from the time you were kids. You just kind of shut off and then you become an adult and you don't even think about it. You don't think about, oh, am I hungry now? Why am I going to the fridge now? Am I actually hungry? Does this make me hungry? Does this not make me hungry? Which foods make me you know, satisfied. It's just, it, it's a never ending, I guess, just cascade of, of information. And just, we, we look at eating and, and feeding ourselves as just kind of secondary to going to work and taking care of the family. And 
I think it's the most important thing we do every day because, you know, you are what you eat literally. And so if you don't take it seriously, then everything else is in this in misalignment. So um, I definitely um, am totally on board with what you're saying there. So um, Cynthia, if you don't mind, I have some quick questions here that um, some of my listeners and my wife had for you. Uh, she loves your book, by the way. Um, and uh, we've been you. listening to it uh, before we go to bed. Uh, we have it on audiobook, so that's a good listen before um, before we turn out the lights. Um, I, her question is because she's a CrossFitter and she likes doing high intensity stuff, but three days a week. So for her, she's uh, interested in body fat loss, but she wants to know like if she's doing a fast, like especially in the morning, and then I mean, she might go for twenty four hours on the days that she's training. Should she be considering more intuitive way to eat uh, so that she gets the the maximum benefit from her fast? How old is oh your boy. wife? She's in her mid thirties. Okay. So she's still at peak fertile years. So I think this is significant. And I would say anyone that's 35 and under, I, and if you're already lean, um, I'm not a fan of women fasting all the time. And I would actually argue there's a law of mm. diminishing returns for lean people doing really long fasts. So I think that's really important. Even if you and your wife are done having kids, I think that's an important distinction. Um, I generally, if people are doing high volume training, whether they're training for an event, like you mentioned, you do, you've done an Ironman. If she's at that level of intensity, probably not fasting those days. Um, I think it becomes very challenging for women to get enough macros in. Mm -hmm. And I think for women, the threshold for protein should be no less than hundred grams a day. And I find a lot of women when they're training, doing high volume training, they're under eating, they're breaking down their muscle and they're, they start becoming some degree of weight loss resistant. The other piece that I think is really important is understanding in the luteal phase, which is after ovulation, this is when progesterone predominates in the menstrual cycle. We're at a position where we're just not as insulin sensitive. That's a time in the menstrual cycle to really back off on intensity, to do less fasting and no fasting the five to seven days preceding your menstrual cycle. So really understanding that in the follicular phase, which is when estrogen predominates, we're more insulin sensitive. That's actually the time in a woman's menstrual cycle to push the envelope. That's when you can do more intense exercise you're going low carbohydrate, you can probably tolerate it. But in my lean, younger women, I don't like them fasting every day. If they're doing high volume training, that's probably not a day to be doing fasting and really aiming for a sufficient amount of protein intake so that they can stimulate proper protein, muscle protein synthesis. Okay. Right on, right on. Um, so then that's a great synopsis. I, 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 I'm not going to say, I'm not going to say that I told her so, but <laughs> I was suspecting that no, no, women, especially younger women, are, that's why I was asking. I, I think that younger women in particular, and I've had some really great conversations um, with colleagues of mine that are experts in this area, and we're all in agreement that I'm very protective of women's fertility. And 35 and under women that are already lean, I don't like them fasting all the time. I really don't. I think it sends the wrong message. Now, if you're polycystic ovarian syndrome, you're obese, you're insulin resistant, you've got a little bit much a little bit more to play with, but the lean women that are, you know, very physically active, I tend to say less okay. is more. Okay, great. That's, uh, that's some very actionable, um, advice. So honey, if you're listening, <laughs> um, <laughs> now the other question is, uh, I have a client that is curious, you know, it's, it's something that I like to, um, I like to bring to the table, but only when they're ready. And she has some questions, namely, like she's heard about side effects like um, hair loss, uh, skin issues. Uh, is is that a concern uh, that somebody should uh, take into consideration when they're getting started with fasting? Yeah, I mean, let's be honest. There there are side effects that maybe fasting is not working for you, especially if you're a woman. Um, do I expect women to sometimes have some alterations in their menstrual cycle the first cycle or two? They're fasting potentially, maybe heavier, maybe shorter. But if your menstrual cycle goes away, that's a sign that your body perceives it's too much stress. Remember, we talked about hormesis. Um, number two, if, if you're not sleeping, like if, you're, if you've suddenly been sleeping really well and then you're not sleeping, if you're struggling with more fatigue or lack of energy, um, hair loss can be from a lot of different reasons. I would be wanting to look at um, you know, their iron levels, their testosterone. If, if people have lost a lot of weight, they can sometimes lose hair, but there are many reasons why that can happen. Could also be a, a nutraceutical issue, so they may need some testing. 
Um, when I'm looking at people that should not fast, those that are pregnant or breastfeeding without question, if you're growing a, fe- a human or feeding a human, um, if you have very brittle diabetes and you're not aware when your blood sugar is low, um, if you're frail and occasionally I get people who want to fast, even though they're really frail, probably not anyone that's listening to your podcast, um, for people that have a disordered relationship with food, whether it's binge eating, anorexia, or bulimia, you definitely want to be careful because this could potentially re-trigger mm. your eating disorder. And so I usually say if in conjunction with your eating disorder specialist, you have decided collectively that you're healthy enough to be able to proceed, then I would do so with caution. And I don't recommend fasting for children. I would say if you're still growing, you don't want to be in a position where you're restricting your calories. I actually have a 15 year old who uh, is a competitive swimmer and he doesn't like to eat breakfast and we don't force him because the kid eats until like 10 o'clock and then he comes home and it's like this massive feeding window Um, and he's still growing and he's thriving and doing well. But I think those are usually the the areas of caution for me that are non-negotiables and then people who really have to be careful if they, if they're fasting. Mm. Great point. Great point. Um, I like that about kids. Um, My son too, occasionally he's like, I'm not hungry. And because I've taught myself a little bit about fasting and I, I go, okay, but you're going to be hungry at lunch. So make sure you, and that's not mm-hmm. an issue. Right. So, um, I want him to be able to control and not always have to eat because we tell him this is the time to eat. So there he's learning, which is good. Um, and then the last uh, question I had was when somebody's breaking a fast, whether it's a 16 hour fast or 24 hour, like what should somebody keep in mind so that they get the most benefit from their fast. Cause I think that's a question even I have, if I'm going to break that fast, like, should it just be like a steak? Should it be, you know, steak and a little bit of fat? Should it have some carbs in there? What, what's ideal or is it really dependent on the individual? Yeah, it's a great question. I would say the longer the fast, the lighter the meal. So you're doing a 48 hour fast. You might be one of those people that after breaking your 48 hour fast, you can sit down and eat a steak dinner I find a lot of people, their their gut just goes, no way. I need something really light. I need bone broth. So the universal way to break a fast, always with protein, either protein and healthy fats or protein and carbs. We know that the protein is going to blunt the insulin response in response to the carbohydrates, but I think it really depends on the individual. I encourage people to experiment. Like I eat a meal when I break my fast. I don't drink bone broth typically or have a shake but that's just because I figured out what works best for me. And I always encourage people to really do a degree of experimentation. But when it comes to longer fasts, like where you are with your 48 hour fast, typically the longer the fast, the lighter the meal, because some people do get some degree of digestive distress. If they eat too large of a bolus of food on an empty stomach after not eating for a couple of days, but I encourage people to, you know, experiment, but always protein, never, you never have naked carbs, Um, you want to always have protein and carbs or protein and fat. And that's really a good rule. Um, again, some people feel like, you know, if they have too much of a large bolus of fat that can upset their stomachs, maybe some protein and some non-starchy vegetables, maybe have a salad. Um, if you tolerate, you know, Greek yogurt, sometimes people do well with that. Um, maybe have some berries in there. So, so understanding protein, 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 but the caveat being be open-minded to experimentation. Mm, I love it. Uh, I typically use uh, Greek yogurt and some berries as my, my first See, bowl. And go. then usually about an hour later, I'm like, I'm hungry. <laughs> and then I have my meal. <laughs> very cool. Uh, very Perfect. cool. Uh, well, thanks so much, Cynthia. Where can somebody find you? You've got a, a book, you've got a podcast. What's the best means to, uh, to find out all the awesome stuff you're putting out into the universe? Well, thank you. Thank you for allowing me to come on and connect with your community. So probably easiest to start with my website. It's www.cynthiatherlow.com. Um, you can access my book, Intermittent Fasting Transformation, I have 45. I have two podcasts. I have the Everyday Wellness Podcast, and I also co-host the Intermittent Fasting Podcast with Melanie Avalon. I'm active on social media, um, especially Instagram. I'm a little snarky on Twitter, so be forewarned. Love it. Um, and I do have a private free Facebook group called intermittent fasting, uh, intermittent fasting lifestyle backslash my name that we have both men and women in that group. It's a nice community where people can ask, you know, pretty easy to, you know, pretty easy, straightforward questions that my team and I will respond to. Amazing. Um, you're doing such good work in the, uh, in the field. And, uh, yes, your, your Twitter account is great, by the way. I, I just lurk on Twitter. <laughs> I get in trouble. <laughs> I get in trouble there occasionally. People are like, what? So I just say, now I'm snarky there. I grew up in New Jersey. It's like, it's, you know, uh, is, how could that's it Bon Jovi's town, way? isn't it? 
I, that was Sayreville. That's Northern Jersey. I grew up at the shore. Oh, okay. So the shore yeah. is middle, you know, middle of the state, central New Jersey along oh, right the shore. On. But they call it sure. the shore. <laughs> sure. Oh, man. Amazing. Uh, Cynthia, this has been a great conversation. Uh, I think we're going to get a lot of actionable information out of this. And I hope, uh, folks, you go out and uh, watch her TED Talk, read her book, and uh, digest everything that you possibly can and, and get informed and uh, get knowledgeable on the topic of intermittent fasting because it is a game changer. So, Cynthia, Thanks so much for coming on the show. And folks, thanks again for tuning in. Train hard, fight easy. Peace.